Greetings, and welcome to our first lecture in Applied Environmental Psychology, The Quest for Utopia. As you may know, the principal assignment in this course, the way you get most of your credit, is through the creation of what we call our relational summaries. Now, a relational summary differs from a normal summary in that what we are looking for is the relationship between the course material and your personal experience. In the relational summary, we use what we are learning from our textbooks, journal articles, and outside readings, and relate the topics to our own lives. Now, we aren't much interested in the parroting of the authors whom you've read. We make the assumption that we all have the same books and material available, and that we can read it ourselves. Now, the relational summary is not a substitute for the assigned reading, and it isn't a shortcut for others to pick up the gist of what we're studying, and it's certainly not merely a way of proving that you've read the material. The relational summary is part of a dialectical thinking and communication, which may be the most important skill you ever learn as a human being. We see dialectical skills being important, for example, in the current presidential debates, and we treasure in our democracy our ability to participate in those debates, much as we see in town hall discussions, debates of where we would like our future to go. This ability for citizens as well as the political elite to discuss and debate their future is a hallmark of American democracy and one that is very rare in other countries around the world. Without it, we have dictatorship. So let's define dialectical thinking for a moment and make sure we're all on the same page. Dialectical thinking is dialogical thinking, that is, a dialogue, thinking within more than one perspective, conducted to test the strengths and weaknesses of opposing points of view. Court trials and debates are, in a sense, dialectical. When thinking dialectically, Reasoners pit two or more opposing points of view in competition with each other, developing each by providing support, raising objections, countering those objections, raising further objections, and so on. Dialectical thinking or discussion can be conducted so as to win by defeating the positions one disagrees with, using critical insight to support one's own view, and pointing out flaws in other views associated with critical thinking in the restricted or weak sense or, fair-mindedly, by conceding points that don't stand up to critique, trying to integrate or incorporate strong points found in other views, and using critical insight to develop a fuller and more accurate view associated with critical thinking in the fuller or stronger sense. Since dialectical thinking is analogous to dialogical thinking, let's examine a definition of that term. Dialogical thinking. Thinking that involves a dialogue or extended exchange between different points of view or frames of reference. Students learn best in dialogical situations, in circumstances in which they continually express their views to others and try to fit others' views into their own. Simple, right? What we're really after is a dialogue. And in the relational summary you write, you are beginning a dialogue between the authors you've read and yourself. And by posting your relational summary, you invite others, me, your fellow students, people outside the class if you like, to participate in that same dialogue. You invite others to express their points of view, and you try to see if you can fit the author's views and the views of your peers into your own. That is the real function of all our assignments. John Taylor Gatto, whose book Weapons of Mass Instruction we are reading this semester, also believes that dialectical thinking is one of the most important things we can learn or teach. He exhorts us to, quote, Teach children to think dialectically so they can challenge the hidden assumptions of the world about them, including school assumptions, so they can eventually generate much of their own personal curriculum and oversight. Now, he applies this to children. We can apply this to human beings at all age levels. And many of our problems in the world today come from most of us spending years in systems that not only didn't encourage dialectical thinking, but actually punished it. So we don't often get sufficient practice these days in the ancient art of Socratic dialogue. Another of our readings this semester, Bernard Suit's The Grasshopper, is written in the form of a Socratic dialogue and represents some dialectical thinking at its best. It gets even better when you engage with the book and bring the dialogue about the game-playing grasshopper and the hard-working ants out into our own reality where it can be discussed with our peers. I have a method for creating the right environment for dialogical argumentation that I use every year here at Mercy College. I simplify things by asking you to do the following. Each time you sit down to write your relational summary, take at least three quotes from the course assigned readings, make note for us of the pages you found them on, and take at least three quotes from outside readings that you discovered to be relevant to our topic. In other words, books or readings you assigned to yourself, 
and make note for us of where you found those ideas so we can find them ourselves if we want to go deeper. Reproduce those quotes or ideas from us and that for us, and then engage in a dialogue with those six quotes, or more, more is always better, by relating them to your own life experiences, your own opinions and observations. The summary that you come up with as you try to relate your life and opinions to what you've been reading about from others' lives and opinions is what then becomes a relational summary. It makes the reading something you can relate to, and in turn becomes something that we can relate to. The second part of the method is for you to involve yourself in a dialogue or discussion with your classmates about the relational summary they posted. Take on the challenge of engaging with what they've written. Question their assumptions. Provide your own perspective. Argue your point of view. Throw some new quotes and evidence at them that either supports or refutes what they have to say. Now, don't worry about being right or wrong in a judicial sense. You will win no points nor lose any points for the opinions you espouse. What we're looking for is that you back up your arguments with a trail of evidence that we can all follow. We want to be able to ascertain what is your personal opinion and what came from others. And we want to be able to go back and look at the source of those from whom you drew quotes and ideas. Most of all, we want to see that you can work with the opinions and ideas of others, give appropriate credit when credit is due, and that you can make a case for your own ideas and opinions by backing them up with personal experience. Since the relational summary is the dialectical foundation of this course, I would like to take this opportunity to model for you how it might be done in my lecture. In fact, a lecture usually is a kind of relational summary. The professor takes what he or she has read, pulls out relevant quotes and ideas, and builds an argument by relating the literature to his or her own life experience as a practitioner in the field. So, my lectures are similar to what I expect from you. They are relational summaries. Normally, we start with a quote or observation from the literature. So, for today's lecture, let's assume that Jane McGonigal is right and that reality is, in fact, broken. 